comes to that. Uh, if, if, if anything happens there. Uh, Sergey, you want to say a word about your office and what you do in that? Oh, thanks very much. and excited to be here. So uh, I manage the uh, uh, Mayor Bloomberg Sustainability and Resilience Program, <coughs> excuse me, in the Mayor's Office in New York City. Uh, we have about 30 people, uh, engineers, architects, policy analysts, uh, attorneys who uh, uh, manage that program. Uh, most recently we had a um, uh, citywide initiative uh, called our special special initiative on rebuilding and resilience that uh, spelled out 257 initiatives uh, to uh, enhance the resilience of the city from uh, coastal measures to utilities to hospitals and food. Uh, so uh, we are in the thick of things, uh, particularly as we as we hand it off to the next administration. Uh, and so I'm thrilled to be here to hear about some of the ideas that you have. So. All right, great. So what, what we're going uh, now? Would I just to introduce who's here? Uh, from the from the groups that were winners in these two contests, and and uh, one of the contests was on uh, was on enabling adaptation. Uh, what enabled what enabling enabling adaptation? What what they were supposed to do? The question was how can business or govern governments or engineers coordinate to ensure the implementation of, of effective domestic and international strategies to prepare for the effects of climate change. One of those groups was uh, was was building consensus. We'll just say more word about word about that when we come to the presentation. But the person who will present that is is uh, Daniel Remore. Um, I'm Danya Ramori. I'm a PhD student here at MIT in environmental policy and planning and also an associate at the Consensus Building Institute over in Kendall, the other side of MIT, um, which is a not-for-profit working on process design, particularly around building consensus, as the name implies. And I also have my colleague Carrie Hewlett here today, and you will see her on the video you yes. will watch in a soon. <laughs> The other one, uh, the other, the other contest winner in this area uh, was from the was the, from the Philippines, and you'll see what that's about in a moment. Do we have? Do we want to wait for that? We don't have that person on the. All right, we'll do that. Okay, we'll come we'll come to that. Uh, and then th then there were two things about adaptation to civil of civil society, and uh, and. One of those was a, was was one from uh, the uh, department in the University of of uh, the, the University of South Africa, and fortunately we have fortunate we have Monica, Monica dos Santos here who would say a word. Just introduce yourself now, if you would. Tell where you're from, your department, and how you got into this. Um, hi, I am currently based at the psychology department at the University of South Africa. I am an academic then in psychology. I hold a PhD in psychology and I'm busy doing another one in clinical psychology. Um, I am newly appointed there. Um, three months ago I was at the Foundation for Professional Development and this is when um, this concept was submitted. Um, that organization is a private university that was started by the South African Medical Association and they work a great deal in the public health HIV sectors throughout Africa. Okay, and the other one is uh, uh, from a, another association in South Africa. Do we, is, is Nikki going to be on later? But not now. Can we put, can we put Nikki up just to introduce herself? Hi, Nikki, would you just say a word of who you are and where you're from? Yes, hi. Firstly, can you hear me okay? Yes, we hear you perfectly. Okay, great. Um, I work for a private consultancy in South Africa, but I do a lot of work um, in helping community organizations build capacity. I've been hired by the Worldwide Fund for Nature to assist a group of farmers in an area called George, which is in the Southern Cape region of South Africa, to build their resilience and ad adaptive capacity to climate change. They face a number of threats to their industry, producing hops, uh, which obviously is an ingredient for beer. So really my role is to support them and assist them to build um, their institutional capacity. Okay, thank you. and. Uh uh, I, I would say that that that, that particular contest, the, the the task of that particular contest, which had to do with uh, with both uh, what Monica Monica's going to present and also the Hops Farmers Association, was what role will civil society actors play in climate adaptation? So what I think we'll do now 
is is take them one by one. We'll take the first contest, which is the which is the facilitating adaptation. I will to, to, I will say I was a judge of this contest, <laughs> this particular one, so I know this one well. And I, I think what I'd like to do is is to start and and we'll go through the two presentations simultaneously. We'll just go through both of them, and uh, and 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 then uh, uh, then we'll turn to the to the panel for your comments, suggestions, whatever you would like to say, uh, and uh, to to, to uh, by way of uh, reactions, helpful comments, whatever. And then we'll we'll finish that, and then we'll shift uh, shift to the other one. So I, I would ask perhaps if if uh, if Danya, you would like to. Present your proposal and your winning proposal, <laughs> and uh, also there's a video that goes with this. So, uh, okay. So I'm going to turn the microphone over to you, three to five minutes to sort of bring the group up together as to what what you have to what you propose. All right. So I'm actually going to have us just start with the video because I think the video does a very good job of laying out what we're proposing to do. And then, do you want me to like answer questions at that point, or we do that all at the end? And then we'll have the panel respond. Okay, great. Well, we'll move around if you haven't seen the video. Perfect, yeah. If you guys want to move here to see it or if you can see from there. So, yeah, let's just start with the video. Okay, so just to kind of build on that, give you a little bit more depth, what we're proposing to do is use an approach we call the consensus building approach or the mutual gains approach in the context of climate change adaptation and actually helping at-risk communities, be they coastal communities or communities elsewhere, actually use this approach, which we've developed and used in a variety of other um, situations from wind energy development to water conflicts to actually develop a plan that is supported by all, all key stakeholders and therefore actually implementable and has widespread buy-in. And as part of this, we actually have an approach that we can use to build public support and awareness. So in our proposal, we've actually put in there that there is a process we can use in advance of this actual facilitated collaborative problem-solving approach to help build that public support. And that's actually part of, um, I'm currently a project manager for a project called the New England Climate Adaptation Project where we're actually testing the use of what we call serious games, like Eric was talking about, to um, get people engaged and aware of climate change risks. So we actually have an approach to engage uh, the public before we do this sort of key stakeholder-driven collaborative problem-solving, collaborative planning process. 
And just to build on this, again, we're actually proposing, um, as part of our proposal for the Cl Climate Collab, to run a competition for coastal New England communities where we'll select a community that's actually going to be a pilot for this process. And that will allow us to actually go through, demonstrate that this process works, which we are very confident it will, based upon our experience using the process and other natural resource planning um, related issues. And through that, we'll develop a, a pilot process that we can use to show others how this works and kind of create a demonstration site. And the idea is that this kind of process, while it will need to be tailored slightly, can be used in communities, towns and cities, internationally, anywhere, um, as long as there's enough buy-in and support at the high level. So the great thing about this proposal is that it is something that's very transferable, um, and we are just proposing for this first phase to do a pilot demonstration community in New England. So um, the final piece about that, again, is that we actually um, have a system in place where we can actually raise the funds to implement this. It's very implemental in the very near future. So it's one of the nice things about the proposal. Why don't you take a seat yeah, here? Yeah. Because you're here and you can sit there. So that's, 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 the, that's the first one. And we'll have a chance for you to feed back and ask questions and also to give suggestions. I will note that there are some people, other people in the audience who are in this business <laughs> in other cities and may have uh, ideas or, or questions. The other winner in this area was, uh, was, was, uh, uh, called photo uh, photo voice for vulnerability, and this is the one that 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 that, that leads us to see the the scale of the issues that we face in in uh, in adaptation, and the different techniques that may be appropriate in different circumstances. So, do we have Zhang Shai Kai? So we can can we turn to that, please? Just turn to the video, and then we maybe we could put Zhang Shai up to say whatever she would like to add. Aloha. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. This is Yan Jun. Uh, I'm a PhD student in the Urban and Regional Planning Department at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. Uh, so, um, you know, regarding our proposal, uh, we have to realize that climate hazards are political. Um, that means that like, there are a lot of voices are absent in uh, facing these challenges we have to face unpredictable and unknown, such as women, children, and elderly. And regarding our um, location uh, or target region for our research, City Hall is in the central Philippines, which is uh, largely influenced and affected by uh, frequent typhoons and earthquakes, uh, which just happened last month in o October. Uh, so we try to using uh, social media networks. Uh, we show approaches uh, through a local lens, send our smartphones to the communities, um, make their voices heard through this uh, process. And hopefully we are able to form um, a disaster adaptation and governance uh, network for all these approaches we are using. And since this is going to be a small scale, but uh, it's an island with uh, a lot of rich bio, um, bio diversities and cultural diversities. And also very dependent on fisheries and also tourism, which is a lot of uh, Pacific, Asia Pacific islands have the similar political, social, and cultural structures. So hopefully we are able to apply that in a broader uh, scale and application. Thank you. Now, can we show the video? Can we show uh, Young Shai's video now, please? Facing unpredictable climate challenges, climate hazards have become a reality to many people and countries instead of a mere imagination. The Republic of the Philippines is one of the most vulnerable countries. According to the 2011 World Race Report published by the United Nations University and the Institute of Environment and Human Security, the Philippines, with a 24.32% disaster risk, has the third highest disaster risk in the world. Sikibor is an island province in the central Visayas region. It has been devastatingly affected by coastal hazards as well as earthquakes in the past five years. Facing disasters, the disadvantaged populations such as women, children, and the elderly more significantly suffered from the impacts of the climate challenges. These vulnerable populations' voices are not being heard in the disaster governance and relevant policy-making process. Therefore, our team initiates Visible Voice. To make those invisible voices visible enables to make a difference. 
The principal investigator, the principal voice, is Yan Jun Tsai, a PhD student in urban and regional planning at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. She's also the founder of Down Motion, the first group in Hawaii to use art for community, coalition, and development. The primary partners of Visible Voice include Coastal Conservation and Education Foundation Incorporated, a leading environmental NGO in the Philippines, as well as the Department of Agriculture of Higiwa. We are using the photo voice of participating photography to make voices heard. Thus, we aim to empower the disadvantaged community members to reveal unheard vulnerability and establish adaptation capacity. To act on the vision, we are going to send out 16 to 20 smartphones with cameras to marginalized participants in two villages. After fundamental training, these participants will take pictures regarding disaster adaptation, upload them to social media, develop narratives, and form leadership action groups based on them during a one-year period. There will be 4,000 photographs, 50 videos, and 30 online articles created. It will influence over 1,000 community members, attract 3,000 bidders for exhibitions and workshops, and 4,000 active online participants through social media networks. The project will cultivate two social media disaster governing frameworks and six pioneering artistic and social leaders. The estimated total budget is 40,000 US dollars, including salaries of product staff, travel and per diem, equipment and supplies, vehicle rental, communication, promotional activities, translators, rental of conference rooms, and publications. We will start from Sikibor, and we will aim far beyond. To tackle climate challenges effectively, we have to recognize that climate issues are always political. We are looking forward to implementing our projects to those vulnerable islands like Sikibor, making the invisible voices heard. Support us, make the invisible visible. Okay, thank you very much. And if we could maybe have Yanjun Chai back up where where she, where she could hear and and participate. So what I would suggest we do now is if is to turn uh, turn to our our panel and lab you give any reactions you have to either one of these, and and uh, you have Danya here to res to respond for for hers, and we'll try to electronically across the world. To, to, to correspond with Hawaii about this as well. And then once you've had a chance to give your views, we just open it up to your thoughts about this, both questions, questions for from the of, of the people who propose this this particular uh, this particular um, idea and and suggestions since there are there are people here who are also working on this these types of these types of issues. The only only observations I would make after after being on this uh, on the judgment on the team judging this, there were 14 proposals in this idea and in this in this particular contest, and this the the span between these two gives you some idea of what there was in between. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the huge huge uh, combination of, of proposals, which 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 reflects a lot about what the challenges are we face. So, um, could I just Start with start with you and and this whatever reactions you have. We're trying just just to start a conversation about this with 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 Danya and with uh, Young Time. Sure. Um, and so you probably ought to use the microphone. I think you can. Of course. This is stuck in this. <laughs> Figure it out. Yeah. Um, so both really interesting projects, and it's it's a it's great to be able to um, have this. Uh, opportunity to respond to them, and it seems like there there's the tensions that I see, and then I, I guess I see them at first as as in tension with each other, and that's that's what I want to talk about. Is that on one hand the the first project is is a uh, is one that is is premised on the on the affordances of of face to face dialogue, of 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 deliberation, of uh, Collaboration around complex scientific concepts that that can can ultimately achieve the um, achieve the the sanctity of policy, uh, and in 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 a way, it's the the, the goal of this is um, it's 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 commendable to arrive at that to arrive at that plan. My question about the the, the first one though is is who are the who are the stakeholders? How are the stakeholders are uh, how are how are they identified? And how does it disrupt the traditional power dynamics that are traditionally in place in stakeholder engagement around any kind of policy decisions? And so while the process seems to be really, um, really fantastic, the question for me really in that is about, 
is about the, the diversity of participants, and not just in the traditional sense of how we think about diversity, but even uh, how, how young people get involved, how, how people get involved who can't show up, who don't have the time, what are ways in which technology might be used to uh, afford different kinds of interactions um, within, within that uh, deliberative space. On the other hand, let me just say something briefly about the, ne the next one. I, on, on, the, on the other hand, and that's just what I wanted to get to is the tension, is that you know, that one is, is, is so focused on the, on the, um, on the social media aspect. And, and in a way, the, um, the, the storytelling that can happen individually and, and, and through networks. And it's really designed, uh, in, in a way, to, uh, to begin a process through individual storytelling um, that, that takes place in a, in a, in a globalized network. Uh, that they can cohere or, or, or find cohesion in that, in, that local, uh, in that local process. And so I think that both of them together are really interesting, or at least that's, that's, that's how I see them. And they both seem to have really, the really um, intense strengths. And, and I'm wondering to what extent each can accommodate either more individual storytelling or kind of or lateral sort of trust making between individuals um, within the first one and then on the, within the second one how it actually accommodates the, the collaborative decision making process that seems to be the, the necessary goal of any kind of process like this. Well, Sergey, you've been at the front lines of us. I, I, I take it that you would, you're thinking about working with a community that might be a community of like 30 or 40,000. The size can vary. Like, but not I mean, it could, not, be a, not, it could be a city, but it's... Not, fi not 15 million. Probably. I mean, probably okay, not, so but it, it was, in a way, yes, but it would be a slightly different process. It'd be more elaborate. Okay, so we turn to somebody who's dealt with the millions. So, oh, well, uh, so I, thought, I thought both um, winners had uh, some really great ideas. And if you look at when we did our, sustain, our, our resilience plan, um, you can't centrally plan it completely. I mean, there's some, there some things that you need um, uh, to, you know, when you're looking at things like networks, you have to look at the the whole, but we also had community teams um, look at you know the six neighborhoods that were really impacted by Sandy, and um, you know you had a community affairs unit come in and and, and really in some cases that it can be um, you know really tough to broker these kind of meetings and, and, and get consensus. So so I think the the premise of both ideas I think is is in line with I think what's needed. I think you need information from the communities. The I'm interested in the mutual gains approach, what what the secret sauce is and what that looks like. Uh, what happens if you can't reach consensus, or is the consensus approach necessarily the best one if you have scarce resources? What do you do? Because in, in every case, you're going to not have all the money. It's, it's different than building an infrastructure project. Uh, when you're actually protecting a coastline, uh, everyone's going to want to vie for scarce resources. What do you do? Uh, uh, can, can you reach that consensus? So I'd, I'd be really interested in hearing what, what that process looks like. I think it could be something potentially uh, really helpful. Um, uh, and, and the other proposal, um, bringing the social media to bear and the, ex people's experiences with, with the, um, uh, you know, the coastline and the communities, I think that's really important as well. What we found in, in the storm that hit us is uh, a lot of times there were really unexpected things that happened that maybe a, a scientist looking at it wouldn't have predicted that water would come this way rather than that way. And, and sometimes, you know, getting that local intelligence, institutional memory uh, from from the local population is incredibly important. And obviously, in a place like Hawaii, um, so um, I think, you know, very interested. Nice job, Lucia. Uh, I find both uh, projects really, really interesting, and uh, I'm more interested in the technical part of it. Uh, how are you going to identify the municipality? You know, with what screening is going to be in place? Because if this, which one, the ones that are more prone to take action, or if it is the most difficult one to create uh, a case study, really, and uh, how are you going to break down all the audiences and um, really look at the power structure in order to create consensus to understand really your audiences really well, but the dynamic more than the single audiences. And it's a really, you know, huge job, but it's extremely interesting to see what you come up with. And uh, maybe there is some sort of lesson learned that can be applied elsewhere. And I was wondering why Northeast? Why <coughs> you want to do this project, you know, in the coastal area of Boston? Why it's so nearby? Um, and how do you plan to scale this up? 
you know, how do you plan to uh, to draw lesson from this experience and make this uh, a best practice and a model that can be uh, replicated. Uh, on the one uh, from the Philippines, it's um, I mean the Philippines are really <coughs> the capital of download worldwide. That's the place where the more download of photo and upload in the whole world. So it's I think it's, it's good to use social media and we do have experience in the same kind of uh, uh, local story to you know to, to global audience. Um, I was wondering if uh, uh, all the, you know, beside the empowerment and participation, how are you going to screen between um, a lot of, you know, low quality material that will come, you know, 4,000 pictures is a big number, but maybe you get uh, four or five very good story. How are you going to actually, you know, deal with copyright and all the rest, because those are real things, you know. You, you, know, you want to do a real story, a report, a publication, but if you don't have copyright, you don't publish, for example. And we went through this. So, And um, the third question was, uh, yes, again, how are you going to scale up and how are you going to work with uh, the major social media network to provide support? So what we might do is ask Danya, if you'd like to, there, there are about three really Good questions there. Do you want to yeah, comment? More than yeah, more than three. You want to you want to respond and then and <laughs> whatever whatever it takes. I think okay. we're okay. And then and then if we could bring up Masai at some point, and because there's some questions for her as well. Yeah, please. Then. Okay, so there were a lot of questions there, and I'm not sure I'm necessarily going to get to all of them. I'm happy to talk with you offline about these things, but I'll try to at least touch on all of them. I think um, to answer Eric's questions, I heard a question about you know sort of technology and using that, and like how do you identify key stakeholders? So kind of the two pieces. In terms of identifying key stakeholders, we actually have a process which was kind of touched on in our video, which we call stakeholder assessment. So we actually go into the communities we're working with and we talk to, we sort of start with the people that are easily identified as individuals who need to be involved in, in this case, adaptation, or who are going to be directly affected by it, so say coastal communities and things of that nature. And we talk to sort of the representatives from those communities who are easily identifiable or who um, there's people we talk to help us identify. So it's sort of this spinning out until we feel like we've really saturated um, our interviews and have people aren't recommending we talk to other people. So we've kind of saturated the market, so to say. Um, and through those conversations, we're able to identify who are the people who have the power in this community, who influences decisions either formally or informally, who would actually need to be involved in the decision-making process for it to go forward without it being uh, resulting in a lawsuit or in sort of, uh, you know, people speaking out against it. So we get a sense of who those key people are, and sometimes it's very evident. It's you know your town planner and maybe somebody from a residence association as well as the um, town manager or, or whatever. But sometimes it's very un unusual people, right? It's somebody who is um, very civically active, um, and you wouldn't know that if you didn't know the community. So we use this process called stakeholder um, assessment to identify that. And through that process, we're able to identify who those key individuals are who need to be at the table. And once we get people there, if they say, wait, 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 like if you really want this to move forward, somebody else needs to be engaged, then we can proceed from, you know, we can do that. Um, so that's kind of how we identify who those key stakeholders are. Um, and then in terms of like, like just reaching out beyond that group, I mean, the, the group is there to represent the dominant interest in the town. But there are a lot of other people who should be kept a, a, abroad or best of what's going on. And as you said, actually youth, like I think in a lot of towns from, we're working with people and they're saying the youth need to be involved. So having a representative from the youth, maybe from a high school or something in on the table is totally possible. But um, but also we can use things like technology and social media to get the word out to the community about what's going on and how they can contribute. And so using these things, sort of like the photo voice, to help inform the process. So it's connecting the sort of informal to the actual formal decision making because at the end of the day a decision has to be made and the town has to buy in, has to be feasible for it to move forward. So you can have all the public input you want, but if it's not fitting into the formal process, you have a problem. So what we're trying to do is reconcile those two things. And also the, the key stakeholders who are there are there to help us get that information um, on the table. So then leading into this question of how do we actually build consensus, it is hard. And if we had magic sauce, it would be wonderful. We'd be uh, making big money. But um, the, the reality is that usually if you get people there having that conversation, you have the right people there, and you have an effective process, 
it almost always leads to consensus in something like this, where it's not necessarily there's a huge conflict. I mean, sometimes we find there are conflictual situations in which consensus isn't realistic and it's not in the best interest of the parties to agree. But typically, something like adaptation, people want to do something, they just don't know what to do. Like, this is what we found working with a lot of communities throughout New England. And so what we're trying to do is help bring resources and information to the table so that they, the town, the city can identify what is realistic, what resources do we have in our community we can bring to bear on the problem, how can we reach agreement so people are willing to put those resources to work, and sort of that's the process we see playing out. And in a place like New York City, it wouldn't just be one group, I and mean, you have different communities within New York City, so you have to do something different. And in terms of resource constraints, I mean, that just may not be a realistic process, but the problem is if you try to push forward a plan and people start suing, it gets expensive really fast. So our argument is that a, a good process can be a lot more cost effective in the long run. So I mean, it's a trade off, right? Um, but that's been sort of our experience. If you can actually do an effective process, it really can be cost effective in the long term. In terms of scaling up, I mean, it's, it is a little bit of a thing that you do place by place, right? And you can do it at different scales. You can do it within a community, within a city, within a region. Um, so you can have different scales at which you're working, but it's sort of uh, a process that you will use in different places. So you could potentially use it somewhere in South Africa, whether again it be a, t a town, a city, a region. Um, but that's the way in which it's scaled, is if we find this is a useful tool and we actually can start to make that case, then we can train people in how this process works. And there are a number of organizations already doing this kind of work um, and kind of develop a best practice that can be implemented elsewhere with the people who are trained. Okay. So I think that's... Thank you. Let's, now, let's see if we can bring Masai on, and because there were a number of questions about, about what you've got thousands of pictures, how, how are you going to manage the process and move from the, the stage that you've described to, effective, to, to an effective application? Just want to sort of respond. To, did you hear what people said? Uh, yes, I do. Okay. Can you hear me? Um, so I think, uh, first of all, I want to... Um, kind of comment on uh, the first comment I got, like how we accommodate like individual storytelling uh, to, uh, with, you know, a more cohesive process. Uh, first of all, I feel like, you know, even though it's only 14, uh, 16, or 20 photographers, but uh, there would be like thousands of committee members engaged in this process. Of, what we are really focusing on is not really the photos we are going to take, but also just uh, we just try to empower the community members to uh, create an open dialogue or uh, a very democratic uh, decision making uh, discourse for them regarding disaster adaptation and governance. Uh, for that process, uh, it will be a social learning process to increase everybody's awareness regarding uh, disaster adaptation and response. Because uh, after all, uh, facing climate hazards, uh, it's mostly our own individual responsibility to deal with and to adapt all these unknown and unpredictable hazards. And then uh, I also got that uh, how we scream like thousands of pictures through this process, uh, how we pick the high quality pictures uh, through the low quality pictures. Uh, just like I mentioned earlier, it's a social learning process. So uh, it's our photographers that are going to screen these uh, photos. They're going to select uh, a few pictures. They will feel um, more touch themselves, or they have a lot more story to tell. Uh, like, like I said earlier, it's a process that people learn from it, people grow from it, people improve and enhance their awareness and promote uh, different learning skills and techniques and and cultural diversity through this process. Okay, thank, thank you. I, I think what, what I'd like to do now is, is go to the other to the other contest to so make sure we get everything on. There's a larger conversation to be had, which is sort of suggested here, but about, about a, a, a bit, bit suggested by by both Sergey and Lucia about how you how would you connect these two things are some potentially connected, but how would that actually work? Uh, but let's leave that for the let's leave that for discussion. Let's get everything on the table. So what I'd like to what I'd like to do uh, now is uh, is is uh, turn to, to to Monica and have her uh, do her presentation uh, of and 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 the movie that we have on on the on the 
your proposal, and then we'll go directly. Uh, we'll, we'll go directly to to uh, to Nikki on the hops uh, on the hops f f uh, group. So, uh, so uh, do you want to start with your film? So let's start with your film, and then, then add anything you would like to add, um, and then uh, then we'll go and talk to the uh, uh, to the farmers group. So please. The psychology department, the University of Southern Africa. There is overall consensus that climate change and verbal warming are the most serious threats to mankind and environment in the 21st century. Africa is also regarded to be the continent that is most vulnerable to natural disasters that are induced by climate change and is likely to cope. Based on this premise, um, African health placements and the foundation for professional development, a strategy to face these concerns in Africa. We are also in discussion with Greenpeace Africa, and we, we envisage a collaboration with them that will target um, civil society and uh, government managers and officials at national and international level. We aim to do this by means of training of civil society groups as well as professionals within government and outside government services, and also by means of a technical assistance model um, that will focus on environment for people. We envisage two Africa health placements um, to look at the recruitment and retainment of health and care health professionals um, to placements in vulnerable areas. Um, together with this, uh, there will be a strong advocacy element to this. And that is we do things we have to also play a strong role. And we really are looking at developing environmental sensitivity, environmental education, so that we can really make an impact um, in terms of saving the environment as far as possible. It's every day I work here in our space. So um, we really need to how we can cope and also mitigate as possible on the effects. Um, we've also conducted research across the world, so I'll share actually our this initiative. And the working goal of um, publishing in our impact journals, so this is a public press, and um, perhaps community advocacy videos, etc. But what really is key for us is the preservation of services and the continuation of education and training and sensitivity. Um, we hope to do this through the Mundial Society and to, to continue to do this through the This is quite an exciting initiative and uh, we have with, uh, a rough board from the bigger um, for the pilot of South Africa that would be approximately two million US dollars. Um, but this project will then be upscaled or downscaled depending on the budget. So uh, Monica, would you like to add anything to what that woman said? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Please. Um, <laughs> I, I think you know if I had to try and sum it all up, uh, we we really are looking at vulnerable areas. Uh, and vulnerable populations. So in Africa, we have really a convergence of problems. We've got HIV, we have poverty, we have geopolitical problems, etc. So um, we have some sort of blueprint of how to roll this out um, because of um, FPD and AHP's experience throughout Africa. So we we do believe this can work and that we are well positioned to undertake this type of work. 
Okay. We'll discuss that further. Now let's go to the uh, the other one, which is now also in Africa, but had but with a specific in, a specific agricultural organization with a specific problem. And uh, so uh, I I think uh, uh, Nikki, I think we'll go first to your we'll go first to your movie, and then have you add anything that you'd like to add. Okay. The Hot Ground area where the project is located lies about 20 kilometers inland of the southern Cape Coast of South Africa, in the Otaniqua Mountains and near the city of George. The area is known as the Eden District, for good reason. It really is spectacular. This is the only area in South Africa where hops is grown. However, hops production is severely threatened by climate change. So farmers have realized that they must adapt to secure the benefits of their enterprise. The fruit of the hops plant, which is a small cone, contains alpha acids, which is a key ingredient used in the manufacture of beer. Although only micromilligrams are used to produce each glass of beer, this is what gives beer its nice, frothy head. The hops production area where our project is located produces 80% of the hops used in the manufacture of beer. By South Africa's biggest brewery, SAB. There is evidence that local average temperatures are increasing and rainfall is decreasing in the farming area. Predictions for the future are marked, especially as competition for limited water resources in the region is increasing through both agricultural and urban development. Farmers have realized that they need to adapt to climate change to secure not only their own livelihoods, but also those of the many families. The Hops Farmers Association is engaging in climate adaptation and resilience building activities, specifically focused on watershed services enhancement and reducing water demand. The program is supported by SAB, WWF South Africa, and the GRB. The key component of the program involves the strengthening and continued support of the Farmers Association to help ensure good governance capacity for water, climate change, and other risks. The intention is to establish a strong and well-capacitated institutional structure that retains the maximum participation by as many farmers as possible. The process of institutional development is also building collaborative relationships between the Farmers Association and other stakeholders in the region. So what is the project cost? The Alien Plant Clearing Group that needs to happen in the area has been estimated to require 40 million rand worth of funding. That's 4 million US dollars. We've been lucky enough to secure 12 million rand, or 1.2 million US dollars, from national government, SAB, and the GRZ. But the farmers are still picking up much of these kinds of costs themselves. The work has already started. Many of the priority interventions will be implemented over the coming three years. But this program will need to run in perpetuity in order that farmers continue to adapt and build their resilience to the climate challenges that they face. Okay, and uh, uh, would you like to add just add anything, or should we go directly to discussion? I think it would be fine to go to discussion. Thanks. Okay, so so let me in this time. I think we go to the panel of any any reactions you may have to this about what you think of it and how this these these two. Examples of of of, of uh, attempts to stimulate civil society into this area might how, how this might work and how, how it might be most effective. So let me, I think we'll start the other way around and start with Lucia since this is somewhat more in your domain. Uh, I'm mostly impressed with um, this. My youth. <laughs> um, with this last uh, uh, presentation, because he had the three very key uh, components, the municipality, the producer, and the private sector. And it seems to me that uh, relating it to their daily life and related to their income 
and making sure that it is relevant for the private sector. This is a project that will succeed. And I think that probably something that could be added, I don't know if, uh, but probably some awareness campaign around the beer, save your taste, since that is the taste of their beer. And uh, if they have a financial gap, I would pass it on to the private sector, really, because that's their brand. <laughs> so I would really externalize uh, the, that cost, too. But I really liked it very much. Uh, well, I'm not an international development expert, so I'm just going to say that congratulations to both winners. I thought they were very uh, meritorious. Um, on the first one, it seems to me that uh, uh, even if you took out the concept of climate change, it would still merit uh, uh, the funding because of uh, institution building and, and healthcare networks and so forth. Uh, uh, I didn't necessarily see the direct link because it, it could, could have stood on its own even without, without uh, the climate impact element to it. Um, and I think the second one is a little bit more focused, um, and I agree with Lucia. Anyhow, um, I, I don't have any really constructive comments other than that, but congratulations. And <clears throat> I'll just say the, the cliche thing, perhaps, but I, I suspect I was asked to be on this panel uh, because I'll talk about technology, so that I'll, I'll do that. Um, and, and, I, and, and my question is, um, it's interesting because here we're dealing, as, as you introduced this panel, we're, this, is, this is obviously about adaptation um, as, a, as, a, as a mode of, of, uh, of operating now. And the question is, what, to what extent does adaptation as a, as a, uh, as a goal lend itself to, uh, to technological um, processes or the affordances that would come with technological communication in some way or another. And I think about the way that, the way that planning used to be done, where you would get together, you would make a plan, and then the plan would be done. Uh, and then you'd have that plan, and then you'd stick with that plan until such time that you need to make another plan. Um, and now we, we don't have to do that. Uh, anymore, perhaps, or we do have to do that, but we have that those plans have to be in constant flux. And in hearing these, I'm I'm wondering to to what extent that that sort of in motion quality to this to this uh, to this organizational inst institutional capacity building and plan making to the farmers buying in to uh, sustainable practices. Um, to what extent is that simply a buying into something that is static? or something that has to evolve over time to which we should be thinking about ways of, of um, appropriating and, and, and adopting networks of communication so that adaptation can happen slowly and subtly um, and in the best interest of the, the people who will be adapting. So it just seems to me that there's, there's, a, there's so much opportunity here to be thinking about um, ways in which communication networks can, can actually help with the, the kind of uh, institution building or organizational building we want to do. <laughs> about what, what did you have in mind ab about communications and networks in your work? Oh, I'm not sure I can answer that one. <laughs> That's a little bit out of my domain. So, um, obviously there would have to be some sort of networking and um, currently how we, we're doing it is more through monitoring and evaluation more than anything else. So, I don't have a conclusive answer there. Um, but just in, in terms of the other comment about is our project, is there a direct, direct link with climate change? Um, well, I'm not an environmental expert. I don't have a background in it at all. So this is my first sort of dealings with it and, and neither does FPD or AHP. However, we do know that Africa is the highest risk con continent with climate change. So that is why we, we thought of Greenpeace, um, but we open to partnerships with anybody in the climate change sector to look at how we can make the link stronger and more relevant. Um, we have built in a strong uh, disaster management component and training of government and civil society members, uh, managers, on, on those levels in terms of climate change. We're really doing it. We're doing it in the HIV sector, how, how to manage HIV or TB or other health-related problems. Um, because one of the, the problems in Africa is a strong management force in, in governments and, and um, those sectors who, 
who need a, some sort of technical assistance. Thank you. Could could we uh, uh, could we bring up uh, Nikki and see if she w would like to respond? I guess one of the, the question about uh, the use of uh, communications and how you would spread what you're doing more broadly applies to you as well. Yes. Um, first of all, thanks for the positive comments. You know, we sit here and beaver away at what we do. It's fantastic to um, hear that what we're doing sounds good to you guys over there. Um, but obviously, in terms of our process that we're running with the farmers, the network building is actually a fundamental component of the approach. We don't have all the answers to the challenges that the farmers face, and everybody acknowledges that. So what we're finding is as we manage to expand our network, draw more people in from different disciplines, other people from the area as well as people from other organizations around the country, we're finding that we are getting new ideas um, to solve the kinds of problems that we have. And in fact, sometimes we're finding that the problems that we have are bigger than we thought, which is not always the outcome we were hoping for. But um, certainly we are finding that through um, getting more people involved and building that relationship network, we are actually having our own social learning process happening in our project. Um, which is definitely helping the farmers get ideas about how to deal with things. Um, what we are doing is very simple communications building process. We have a website for the project. We do send out newsletters. We do sit on a number of forums in South Africa that deal with climate issues, water issues, etc. And really what we're finding is that as we're going, we are building our network just through word of mouth more than anything else. Okay, thank you very much, Nikki. Now, what, what I suggest now is that we just open this up to any comments or suggestions or questions that you may have or other things that our, that our, uh, our committee of three would like to do. And, and let me suggest that because we have people on the wire far away, it's important that whenever you speak, you use the microphone. Otherwise, they won't be able to pick it up. So may I start with you? Um, hello, I have a question for Monica about the, your title there, the steps to an e ecology of mind. If you could expand on what that what what that okay. means, because I think the the reason I'm asking is that the predecessor to technology communication is the human communication, and my sense is that you you may addressing it from a psychological point of view have, can share well, something with us. I think some of you may know that that title is from a Gregory Bateson work, which I read probably 15 years ago, so maybe that planted a seed in me somewhere along the line. But also, I mean, how, how my initiation into the whole climate change sort of field or direction was um, via a piece I wrote with three other collaborators regarding narcissism in human functioning and how that on a conscious and subconscious level and how that impacts on the environment. So steps to an ecology of mind was steps towards changing mindsets. So it was an amal amalgamation of my creativity and <laughs> thought pattern. I've got a question for uh, Sai, so I don't know if she's still online. <clears throat> I'm really interested in your um, photojournalism project, and I'm just wondering what you have in mind to do with the, um, the photographs. Is it you're just going to be on social media sites? Are you doing art projects with them? How, how does that tie in with, the, um, with your vision for what you see happening with this project in the, in the future? Nope. Nope. Just a bit. Uh, She's muted. Uh, you're, you're, let's see. Okay. Can you hear me now? Uh, yeah, start, start again because yeah. you were muted for a minute there. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you for your comments. I think besides the uh, social media, online galleries, uh, things existing online, I think we will plan to host like, uh, different types of exhibitions in art galleries, uh, also uh, at different universities, um, different visual interactive um, exhibitions because uh, I was a curator before so I'm very open for 
ideas like that, and then also just uh, create the bridge between, you know, online and offline creativities. Hi, kind of a follow-up question for you. Um, Rachel Peterson from the World Resources Institute in Washington, D.C. Um, I'm curious what sort of concrete plan you have in place or relationships that you've started building in order to move from this place of curating thousands of photos to actually building the capacity of existing institutions and organizations on the ground. Mm -hmm. Because I think it's great you know, to build the sort of mm -hmm. visual ethnographic account um, mm -hmm. But as Marshall said in the a previous panel today, you know, a million mm -hmm. clicks is great, social media is great, but if you don't have mm -hmm. the capacity in place, you'll never see social change from that. Um, so I was curious, sort of, the, the, the plan you have moving forward in order to show people on the ground that this is truly an empowering project, as you say, and an opportunity for them to get their voices heard. Thanks. Thank you. Um, First of all, uh, actually, besides our team, we are going to uh, collaborate with the local NGOs such, such as CCEF and also local government, agricultural department uh, in City Hall, because uh, they have been dealing with a lot of coastal management and coastal hazard adaptation work in the areas. But there's, um, it seems like traditional uh, climate adaptation and uh, disaster adaptation uh, approaches are not that effective in the area. So that's why um, we try to cooperate together to uh, build up something beyond just we create thousands of photos, we create different social media platforms, but we are actually focusing on how using these social media networks and platforms to really influence the policy making, especially in the areas where governance may not be that uh, formal and there's a lot of flexibility regarding governance structures. Thank you. Hi, um, this is a question for the building consensus group. Um, I was just curious, um, you said that you had experience doing planning of this sort in other areas of natural resource planning. I'm wondering what some of the outcomes of those processes have been, and also um, do you have any kind of expectations about what the results might be once you implement the project that you've discussed here today, like what sort of some of the outcome comes might be in terms of planning? That's a great question, and actually Carrie Hewlett is probably the best person to talk about the other processes since she's been doing this much longer than I have. Um, so I may even have you talk about that, Carrie, but I will address the first question um, as Carrie gets the microphone. Um, with this sort of process, I mean, it depends a little bit on your working with a community, however you define that, and how the process works will depend on that community. But what we ultimately envision is there are a lot of things that at-risk communities can do today to increase their resilience today and in the long term that they're just not doing. So like a very clear takeaway is to help identify those things and make sure they happen. The sort of no regrets approaches, the, the co-benefits approaches, the things where you can achieve resilience by actually benefiting your community through economic development, other various things. So definitely identifying those and um, developing a process for actually getting them implemented and ensuring there's buy-in. And so that actually proceeds in helping um, communities find the funding if they need to through all the different resources that exist to do that. So that's sort of a clear takeaway. Um, in addition to that is really thinking about this sort of incremental uh, adaptation. So helping communities have the sort of social capital to be working together as things emerge to keep moving forward and planning that as, as brought up is going to have to be ongoing. And that requires a lot of working together across sectors and across scales, so local communities working with regions. So ensuring that the uh, capacity is there to, to do that incremental adaptation as it needs to be done, that's another very clear takeaway. And then beyond that, it's sort of how far does the community want to go in terms of creating a plan and actually implementing something today or creating a plan that sort of has this laid out implementation over the next 10 to 15 years with plans to kind of adjust as need be. So Carrie, do you want to speak very quickly about other areas? Sure, sure. Hi. Um, hi. Thanks for asking the question. Uh, CBI is an organization that works on this kind of consensus building in a lot of different ways. And I'll just give you an example that's very relevant to the project that we proposed here. We recently just um, completed a consensus-based process in Kingston, New York. And Kingston is on the Hudson River. And they just put together a climate adaptation plan. And we were the facilitators that moved them through that process. And we did 
more or less exactly the type of project that's been described where we identified the stakeholders through a stakeholder assessment, brought them together, facilitated them through the joint fact-finding process, and then the result is an actual plan which you can download from their website. So CBI has done that in a number of different areas. The Kingston plan is, uh, we hope to do a lot of this in climate adaptation. That's part of the reason why we've entered this, um, this contest with MIT. But we've done that same process in a variety of different re areas. But adaptation is sort of the, the one that we're trying to build. I guess I guess I had a question for Sergey about this, uh, the scale issue. What's it like when you're trying to, the, 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 you're talking about doing this, and I can almost imagine that for Belmont, Massachusetts, which is only has 29,000 people. But what's it like when you try to do that at at scale? Is this is this a scale idea? To, uh, the, to oh wow, that's a that's a tough. I mean, <clears throat> I mean in in our case, what what we had to do was. Uh, so you send entire teams out to the communities that were impacted because they were all so different. I mean, if you look at New York City, it's like uh, you know dozens of different ecosystems, uh, different demographics, ethnographics. Uh, the city, every every block has a novel written about it. Uh, it it's uh, it's it's a really complex city with a very passionate group of stakeholders. So you know the issues in the Rockaways are very different than in Staten Island than in Garrison Beach than in uh, Williamsburg. So you needed people who understood the the uh, uh, the community first of all, people who understood the geography um, embedded in each one of those processes, the process the way we had which I'm sure could be improved on with, with these kind of tools. Um, so it, it takes a lot of face to face and it takes also making sure that um, you know, you come in with a game plan and, and you change it uh, immediately when you realize what people really want. Um, and so you have to be very flexible. You have to. Part of it is the, the personality uh, of people coming in. They need to. They need to have that mixture of uh, leadership and, and sensibility and listen. I mean, it's just. It's one of those things. It's the secret sauce that I talk about. <laughs> um, but um, but yeah, I mean, I think it's scalable. But you need the right, the right people with the right uh, expertise and and reach in those neighborhoods. So. I can just do a real quick follow-up on that. I, don't know if that's, mm -hmm. um, I think the reality is well, what we're seeing is that big municipalities are moving on adaptation in a way that most other at-risk communities aren't. So I think that's particularly the reason we're seeing this as being um, very necessary, but I still think it can be very implementable at the like larger municipal municipality scale. It's just like I said earlier, the process might look a little bit different, and I could see it being a little bit more of the coordination between, say, the city of New York as a whole with those actual communities and helping facilitate that kind of working together or working at the local communities and then having a way to make sure that what happens with the local communities and sort of things they think they need somehow gets transferred up and actually happens. Because right, it's one thing to have local communities say, this is what we need, we agree, and then you go to the actual city and it doesn't happen, there's no funding. So it's to help facilitate that process. And in a city, it will be a little bit less sort of like just one process and maybe a couple different ones. John? Yeah, I had um, two questions, one, one for Danya and then I think one for everyone. Um, so Danya, I think you um, indicated with your project that having an independent facilitator was a key component. I'm wondering if, if you could just elaborate a little bit more on that independence because yeah. if you have to raise money every time for every community that seems kind of onerous and there are a lot of communities that can as you know that can pay for services um, but would you see that as compromising um, the process if uh, a, a municipality paid uh, for the services oh, um, and then the other question is, um, we often think about adaptation in terms of preparing for disasters, um, which of course is an important thing and it's a very tangible effect um, uh, to talk to people about and something I think it can be easier for people to understand, but then there's also the sort of slow moving effects of climate change and uh, the fact that our the character of the places where we live will change. So like in New England where we're at, going from a snowy uh, uh, winter place uh, um, to uh, uh, a place with long hot summers and no snow, uh, it has a lot of cultural, economic, and social implications. And so I'm wondering if any of these, pro these approaches on engagement um, can work with both kinds of effects or do they need to be adjusted or maybe do they work best with just one category of effects. 
Excellent. That's a really great question. It's actually something probably hasn't been highlighted enough in this conversation. Like we really see a neutral, as we call it, neutral or a independent facilitator is really key to the process we're proposing for a number of reasons. One being that they're not a stakeholder, so they can actually come in and help people have a conversation without being seen as like, why are you, you're trying to steer us in a certain direction. You have a vested interest. So the whole idea there is to help people have a productive conversation in a way that only somebody who's not part of that community and invested in that community really can, and there's a lot of literature and a lot of research behind that assumption. It's not an assumption, it's sort of a, um, that fact, I guess. Um, and so that's a really key part of this. It's also partially just that having somebody to help steer the process, to make sure things keep moving forward, to hold people accountable, to make sure they show up. When there's a meeting, all of those various things, that's the role of this individual. And again, they're sort of there to help the community move itself forward, but that means holding the individuals accountable if there is sort of environmental justice issue that's not being addressed, making sure that that voice is represented. Like that's the role the facilitator plays in all of this. Um, and in terms of the actual cost, it depends. We say there's a convener. There's a group that convenes this process. And usually the, using a town, like the town government needs to be that convener because they need to say whatever comes out of this process, we're going to implement it. Because without that, you don't have teeth, right? You have this big process and nothing happens. So they do need to play that role. Whether or not the funding comes from them actually depends. It depends. <laughs> um, if they're not, if that's not seen as swaying the um, the process, then that actually can be okay. Um, but a lot of time, the funding will come from like the, a variety of people in the community to kind of spread the um, you know the force. So it's not seen as one party is paying for it and therefore going to steer the process. Um, and a lot of times, we actually end up like trying to raise some grants with the community to help fund the process. Like that's one of the roles we can play is helping them fund this process. So usually there's at least some in kind because the town and the stakeholders there need to have some skin in the game for it to feel like they're really invested. But there's a, like through bringing on somebody to help steer the process, they can also help find the funding to fund the process. Okay, thank you. I think we're running out. We're running down of our time now. I, I, I turn back to the back to the to the panel. I know Marsha had a comment and just see what other thoughts you may want to offer. Really offer to these to these people who are trying to do this. Uh, questions for them or any other uh, any other thoughts about this whole process that we're going through here? Any, anyone? Uh, I, I think that uh, Sandy has shown New York that climate change is very real. And uh, unfortunately, or uh, uh, this lesson has not been learned widely enough. So I was really wondering, how are you going to deal with deniers? And how are we going to impress the sense of urgency? Because it's not happening in the next 30 years. Uh, we have plenty of reports of uh, the 4 degree report, for example, that uh, we issued last year. This is something that needs to be addressed now. And uh, that's why I like all this project, because they look from different standpoint to the, the issue, but the behavioral change and the perception change has to happen no. now, I no. think. Let me just, let me, let me draw to the others. Any other thoughts from Sergey or? Yeah. Eric? I mean, I'll, res I'll respond to, so I think that one of the issues is that no one really wants to deal with climate change because it's a drag. And uh, and and it's so and it seems like that and that's and I, and I mean that seriously and and I think that there's there's an opportunity here where, um, you know, to to make a pitch for thinking about this in kind of playful ways is that the the, the goal might not be right now to tell people how bad it's going to be and and what needs to happen but maybe the goal is actually to sort of open up and play a little bit and so here's my pitch for games. Um, where you know that there is an opportunity here that and you know games is, I don't mean games in a gamification way it's not about it's it's not about sort of forcing behaviors but it's about opening up possibilities and and I think that's kind of where we can be right now is is when we engage people it's it's not about um, it's not about getting them to the conclusions that they need to be at or that even the community needs to be at but it's about opening up possibilities and using imagination to sort of think through. Um, together, uh, what this might be. So I think there is. Uh, so I would. I would just like to see that the the way we approach engagement is is uh, is not all about the, the kind of efficiency of collaborative process, but in fact about the potentiality of collaborative process. Yeah. Um, I don't have any uh, great wisdom except to say uh, uh, congratulations to all the four winners. And uh, uh, and and the other thing is, you know, 
don't necessarily listen to all the experts. Every situation is different. Let a thousand flowers bloom. Um, I'm certainly not going to tell you what's right and wrong. I have one experience. Others have another. Uh, this is really exciting what you're doing. I think it's worth the experimentation. Every community is going to be different, and w one or more of these are going to work. Um, you know, we, we had been working on a climate adaptation plan for a couple years before Sandy. We had, you know, 40 infrastructure operators in, in a room. We had, uh, you know, everyone at the table, but things would move so slowly um, until Sandy hit, and then things happen really unexpectedly. You, you realize things that you didn't when you were planning it in advance, <laughs> that, you know, if, if an entire peninsula or everything south of the Empire State Building is black. Well, you can't charge your cell phone. Um, you can't, you know, suddenly buildings are... It, so many things happen that you never expected, or a heat wave hits and suddenly a part of the city is blacked out. Um, so it's really hard to plan these things in advance. So I think some of the local intelligence, it's actually a really interesting concept. You know, com the idea of community resilience, you know, how do you have pockets of, of resilience? How do you leverage institutional information and knowledge? Uh, this is really exciting stuff. And in, in many cases, if you're going to be addressing uh, neighborhoods or regions that haven't been hit really hard in the past, uh, you're gonna. It's gonna be tough to get uh, to plan something well in advance, even if you hire the best engineering firms and and, and bring the climate scientists together. But um, so anyhow, really exciting. Again, as I said, you know, I, I don't want to be a naysayer for what you're doing. I think it's great. And uh, and if you ever need to reach out to me, uh, I'm, I'm happy to talk to you about what we did. So, but I think it's really exciting. Let me, let me, let me just turn briefly to. Uh, <laughs> To Jun Tsai and and uh, to Nikki, do either of you want to ha any final thoughts based on what you've on this conversation? Let's start with with Nikki. Anything or anything you would like to add? You're on. Um, <laughs> uh, really, just to say thanks for the opportunity to have been part of this. I think I found the discussion quite useful. Certainly for our project, um, some of the ideas around uh, certainly the crowdsourcing idea the community approach to consensus building around ad ad adaptive response has been very useful for me. So, you know, even if we don't end up with the $10,000 grand prize, it's certainly been a great experience, so thanks for that. Okay, and uh, Yong Tsai? Uh, yes, uh, I think it's my and Nikki, I'm very thankful for every comments, and it's it has been an amazing process. We have learned a lot, go a lot, and sharpen a lot for our projects and and looking at issues in a more um, you know reasonable way think about the opposite side and so it has been very helpful and looking forward to hearing back more from all of you and thank you so I, maybe I'll just close with, with, with one one chairman's com comment <laughs> that uh, I, I, I get I get two I get two conflicting emotions out of all this. One is is a feeling of the scale of the challenge we face across so many across so many jurisdictions and, 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 and such. And this was really a lesson for me. But the other is that that just this electronic gizmo we just did here <laughs> indicates same things that are possible for communicating with large numbers of people. And the fact that we that we ran this we ran, we ran this session around the around the globe all at once um, indicates that that there are there there are ideas for t for bl for blending these different approaches which seemed to me when I first looked at them totally unrelated but they're not totally unrelated and that's a, that's a lesson for this I think this makes quite useful let me for, let me first thank Zach O'Quarty that, that <laughs> this doesn't happen automatically all this electronic gadgetry so thanks thanks for that and that was good and uh, let, let, let me let me thank the, let me let me once again congratulate the, the winners and also thank them for their really excellent participation in this discussion and also join me in, in in thanking our panel for helping make this work so well and I believe according to the schedule there's some sort of a reception with Goodies, is that right? Anyway, it's on the it's on the program, and I, let me also th thank the audience. This has been a good discussion, and also quite active and and in, and and obvious great interest. So it makes this kind of operation work. Thank you. <laughs>